Hey there, my name's Daniel Brown, and in honor of World Lit Read Aloud Day, I'm going to read my book from Outskirts Press, which is the newest uh, release that I've got, which is Eli, Mystery on the Yazoo River. And it was illustrated by a very, very talented artist by the name of Victor Geisa. So Victor did a tremendous job on the colors and the illustrations, and he brought Satarsha, Mississippi to life. So I'm gonna go ahead and tell you on the front end that this is, was a bedtime story told 35 years ago to my son. And so we went ahead and put it into the form of a book and Outskirts Press did a majestic job putting everything together. So let's get into our story this morning. It had been about three months since Timmy and Tori led their good friend, Eli, the giant catfish, downriver and away from a mean, old, ugly-faced fisherman by the name of Cletus Ray Johnson. Cletus was trying to catch Eli just to have a trophy to put on his wall. No one in the village liked that idea. So Timmy and Tori decided to hide Eli by taking him downriver and away from that mean old Cletus with his bad attitude and really stinky breath. But one thing that Timmy and Tori did not know is that fish have an amazing ability to return home to where they used to live. On a beautiful sunny day in Satarsha, Mississippi, Timmy was doing some repairs on his raft named the Yazoo Dream. He was down at the levee landing at the edge of the Yazoo River. He brought along a hammer and a few nails with the intention of nailing down a board that was beginning to wiggle loose. Now taking out his hammer, he began to pound a few nails into a board to securely and firmly put it back into place on the raft. While he was hammering on that board, he noticed that a small wave was moving in the current of the Yazoo River. He looked up from it, his work, could it be? Eli, is it him? Did he come back home? Eli reached out and he patted the head of that mighty catfish like he'd done a hundred times before. Nice to see you, old friend. Eli was so excited. He had to run and go tell Tori. He was not going to, she's not gonna believe this news. Timmy looked down at this huge catfish and said, don't go anywhere, big fella. I'll be right back. Timmy sprinted up the levee landing and ran over to the general store. Mr. Hart and Mr. Potter were inside the store playing their daily game of checkers. The door of the general store flew open like an explosion. Both checker players stopped and looked up with concern on their faces. Mr. Hart said, Dab, burn it, Timmy. You about gave me a third degree heart attack. What's going on, young man? Have y'all seen Tori? Timmy asked, trying to catch his breath. I heard someone say that she was over at the cotton gin office looking through some Halloween decorations with a few of the ladies, Mr. Potter said as he reached over for his bottle of Yazoo Cola sitting next to the checkerboard. Thanks, Timmy yelled, turning and leaving as quickly as he arrived. Racing across the street to the cotton gin office, he found Tori and three women going through a large box with the words Spookums written on the side in big black letters. Without hesitation, Timmy hollered out across the office, He's back! He's back! Timmy told Tori he was pounding a nail into his raft and Eli swam up to the side of the raft. The noise must have called out to him. Together, they ran back to the levee landing and climbed aboard the raft. Tori could not believe it, but there he was, a proud Tori said, in a soft southern drawl, Eli done swum back home. She reached down and she patted the big fish on the top of the head. Do we have any chicken livers? Not sure, Timmy said, but I'll run home and I'll look in the freezer out in the garage. I can't wait to give the big guy a treat. Chapter two. Over the next few weeks, Timmy, Tori, and Eli were inseparable. The general store sold a record amount of chicken livers over that same period. Old Eli was living large and loving the treats from Timmy and Tori. He was one big old happy catfish. 
It was now the end of October, and it had not rained really hard since June the 7th. That thunderstorm was a real frog choker. The Yazoo River water level was lower than it had been in quite some time. Returning from the school one afternoon, Timmy and Tori walked down to the river landing, and Tori pounded on the side of the raft with a pipe, and she looked up and down the river for Eli. She put her hand up to her forehead to shield the bright autumn sunshine from her eyes, and she could not see the big catfish in the river. And she said to Timmy, that's funny. Where does a 14 foot catfish hang out when the river's this low? Timmy said, I don't know. Keep hitting the side. He'll show up for dinner. He always does. Tori wrapped out a beat on the side of the raft with an old pipe and still there was no Eli. And it was a couple minutes later that a huge splash was heard up river. Timmy grabbed a long pole that he used to guide the Yazoo Dream raft down and along the river and he began pushing the raft up river in the direction of that splashing sound. There was a small current in the river that day and they both heard another loud splash. They could see that something big was causing quite a ruckus in the river. When they got closer, they noticed that it looked like Eli was trapped behind a couple large trees lying on top of each other near the river's edge. Eli was trying to get to the kids but the big trees were in his way. Timmy said, I need to either move one of those logs or maybe it'd just be easier if I pushed and guided Eli up river a few feet. Surely he can get free and, and into deeper water of the river. Tori said, this water's so low. The water level seems to be confusing him. Timmy slid off of the raft and swam over to the big fish. He gently pushed that massive Eli towards some deeper water and until he was clear of those logs. Tori tossed a few chicken livers to Eli and she pointed at the two big logs and she said, I don't remember ever seeing those logs before. Timmy crawled back onto the raft dripping wet and shaking his head and he said, I don't believe I've ever noticed them either. Then again, the water level is really, really low. Maybe they've been here all along and those logs are just now coming into view. Tori pointed, those logs looked like they were put there on purpose. Timmy said, what do you mean on purpose? Well, it, it sort of looks like there could be another log underneath the two logs that we can see. I wonder if these logs were placed here by somebody years ago for some reason, Tori continued. When we get home, I'm gonna tell Granddad about it. Maybe he'll know what this is. Chapter three. Tori told her Granddad all about the logs in the river and his eyes grew large. He told Tori, years ago when I was just knee high to a Delta grasshopper, I was told by my great grandfather that somewhere on that Yazoo River near what is now the village of Satarsha, Mississippi, the French built a camp or maybe even a fort. It was like a trading post that the French placed there to trade with the Yazoo and Choctaw Indians. The Indians, they, they had fresh food and vegetables and the French had knives and shovels and tools that had been made and brought to the New World from France. The French traders brought their goods up and down that Mississippi River and they built a trading post somewhere near Satarsha long before Vicksburg, Mississippi was even on the map. Granddad said, can you take me there? Tori smiled and she said, I sure can. How about tomorrow after school? Tori told her granddad's story to Timmy on the school bus and they couldn't wait for school day to finish. When school was over, Tori and her granddad met Timmy at the raft down by the river landing, and together the three of them pushed off away from the riverbank, and the Yazoo Dream raft glided upriver to the point where they saw the two logs. When they got there, they could see another log underneath the two logs that they had seen the day before. Granddad said, kids, that's part of a wall. This could have been a log fort. The logs in there are in great shape because wooden tree logs do not deteriorate and they don't fall apart when they're underwater. I think you may have just found that French fort known as Turnbull Stand. Many of my ancestors have talked about this fort, but they were never able to find it. They moved closer to the raft, closer to the riverbank, and, they out, and sticking out of the edge of the dirt was what looked like a small wooden box, about one foot by two foot. Granddad asked Timmy, 
Can you please hand me that pipe that you've got over there on the side of your raft? Timmy handed him the pipe and Granddad used the pipe to dig the dirt away from the box and he was able to carefully lift it out of the dirt and onto the raft. The box was very muddy. It was about to fall apart. Tori reached down and gently opened one side of the box. There were all kinds of objects covered with mud. Granddad looked at Timmy and Tori and said, let's take these home and clean them up and see what they might be. Excitement was on their faces as they made the short trip back down the river to the levee landing. Chapter four. They were all gathered around the driveway of Timmy's home as the water hose was uncoiled off the wall of the garage. The hose was dragged across the driveway over to that fragile box. That box was about to fall into pieces as they gently reached in and pulled out a pottery bowl and a gold coin with French writing on it, another old piece of pottery, what looked like a few old nails, and a small short pipe which may have been used for smoking tobacco a long time ago. They also had two rusty knives that were covered with a crust of mud and a small bracelet with unknown writing on it. A light mist of water was sprayed onto the items to clean the mud gently and carefully off of them. Timmy's dad said, I think you kids may have just found a French fort that has been spoken about for generations around here. We need to call the university and tell them of your discovery. This may be a big piece of Mississippi's lost history. Chapter 5. About a week later, Dr. Smar T. Pants from the university drove to Satarsha, Mississippi. He steered his research van into the driveway belonging to Tori's family. Tori and Timmy were allowed to skip school that day to meet with a professor of Native American Studies. After extending a greeting to everyone, Dr. Pan said, Tell me, kids, how did you come to make this discovery? When Tori told him that Eli had led them over to this fort, the professor said, Oh, I see, and may I meet Eli and shake his hand? I don't think he'll let you do that, Timmy said with a slight grin, but if you want to pat him on the head, he seems to like that a lot. The professor looked around at everyone as if they were cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. Oh, that's right, you don't know about Eli. Well, if you'll follow us down to the river landing, we'll introduce you to him, Tori said with a small grin on her face. It took only a couple minutes for the small group to walk down to the levee landing, and besides having the Yazoo Dream ready and on the side of the, the river, Timmy's dad took a pontoon boat and had it brought in to carry several people. Dr. Pans asked if he could ride on the Yazoo Dream with Timmy and Tori. Timmy took a long pole and he pushed that raft away from the riverbank. Tori reached down and pulled out the pipe that they had kept on that raft. And Tori raised that pipe and she began thumping on the side of the raft. Dr. Pan said, good gracious, child, what are you doing? Tori gave him a quick smile and said, well, you said you wanted to meet Eli. We're gonna do just that. And if you wanna give him a treat, he'd really like that. Dr. Pan's had a puzzled look on his face as a wave began to come closer and closer to the raft. He said, oh no, an alligator's coming towards us. Tori began to laugh as his huge 14-foot catfish raised his head up out, to, out of the surface of the Yazoo River and up against the side of the raft. Timmy gave a quick introduction. Dr. Pans, this is Eli. Eli, I'd like for you to meet Dr. Pans. The professor was speechless. No one prepared him for a ginormous catfish, and this one seemed to be more like a pet if you want to pet his head, he really likes that a lot. Oh, and he likes chicken livers too. Tori said with a grin. For a few moments, Dr. Pans forgot all about that French fort. I guess a ginormous catfish has that effect on someone who does not get out of the office that much. Chapter six. It took another 10 minutes before the Yazoo Dream pulled up next to the logs coming out of the riverbank. Timmy's dad followed the pontoon boat and pulled up beside the raft. He tied up his boat next to it. Dr. Pan said, and Eli led you over to this? 
Timmy said, he sure did. Dr. Pan stepped off of the raft and onto the firm brown Mississippi Delta soil of the riverbank. He pointed to something sticking out of the bank. It was round. Dr. Pans gently lifted the bowl out of the dirt and said, the Yazoo and Choctaw Indians made pottery like this. I've only seen a few pieces in the museum, but I've never seen anything as nice as this. This one's not broken. You kids have truly made an amazing discovery. We need to get a team from the university out here to carefully examine what appears to be the lost French fort known as Turnbull Stand. We knew the fort existed, but no one was ever able to find it. We knew that it was upriver and northeast from Fort St. Pierre. Dr. Smarty Pants said, who would have ever thought that a mystery 300 years old would be solved by a giant catfish named Eli in the Yazoo River? Chapter seven. Dr. Pans left the Yazoo River and walked over to a telephone that Mr. Potter had sitting on the countertop of the general store. He called one of the foremost and best Mississippi antiquity experts. And if you're asking, what's an antiquity expert? Well, it's a person who knows a lot about really old stuff. Dr. Pans called Dr. Seymour Bones from the University of Dixie. Folks around the university just called him Dr. Digger when he wasn't close enough to hear them. It was two hours and 30 minutes later when Dr. Bones drove into the village of Satarsha. He stepped out of his research van in front of the Yazoo, or the general store. Dr. Pans told Dr. Bones, I don't know how long we will be able to explore Fort Turnbull Stand. They tell me that rain is expected in a few hours. If it rains really hard, the river level will rise and the water will likely hide what is left of this old French fort. Dr. Bones had three men, shovels, lights, and equipment, and his university research van. The men were determined to work through the night to discover any part of the fort's history that may have been hidden by the Yazoo River. Chapter 8. Dr. Bones had a piece of equipment called a metal detector that could find metal buried in the sand and mud at the river's edge. Within minutes, that metal detector was chirping like a bird. The men brought out shovels and delicately removed all kinds of different objects out of that brown soil. The men from the university dug in the dirt much of the night and they found rare coins, a few bowls, a rusted knife, and bits and pieces of an antique rifle that was clearly very old. It was late into the night when the wind began to blow in from the north, the stars disappeared way off on that northern horizon. Flashes of lightning could be seen in the night sky. The temperature had dropped from 84 degrees to 70 degrees in a very short amount of time. Both Dr. Pans and Dr. Bones knew that it was only a matter of minutes before the rain would come and the water level would begin to rise in that river. It was at 3.16 a.m. that the metal detector made the loudest long beep. The men began to smile as they dug into the sand. A mist of rain began to fall on the team. They found a metal box that was 12 inches deep and 18 inches long. It was full of something. Could it be important? Why would someone leave a box? Was it special? The rain quickly began to fall faster and harder. The team from University of Dixie knew that they had to pack up their lights, their shovels, their equipment, or it would all be lost to the rising river water. They filled up the pontoon boat as fast as they could with the equipment and they glided away. The men were now running with their flashlights in hand to see if there was anything that they might have missed. Everything that the team had found buried in the sand was placed on the Yazoo Dream Raft. The raft was designated for discoveries. The raft would be used to float all the historical findings of that French fort across the river and back to the village. The men were leaving and began pushing the Yazoo Dream away from Fort Turnbull Stand and a rush of water from upriver came to them. In the driving rain and darkness, it was hard to see. They could see in the flashes of lightning that they didn't have much further to go before they arrived at the levee landing. It was at this point that Dr. Smarty Pants actually dropped his paddle in the current of the Yazoo River. 
The flow of the river was much faster now, and his paddle was flowing away just out of reach of the two men on the raft. Dr. Bones reached out for the lost paddle, using his paddle, but all he could manage to do was slap at that water. He tried over and over, and he could not reach that other paddle. The two men on the raft did not know what to do. If they don't reach that river landing on that other side, they will float helplessly downriver along with this driving rain. But, but down on the bottom of that Yazoo River on that very night was a mighty catfish. Old Eli could hear all that noise coming from the river surface. He had been trained to come to the edge of that raft by Tori and Timmy when there was a loud noise. The two men could not believe their eyes when a giant catfish came up out of that dark water to the edge of the Yazoo Dream. In the flash of light of the lightning, they could see a massive fish. Old Eli must have been thinking, it's a little light late in the night for snacks and treats, but hey, I love a treat no matter what time of day or night, or the weather conditions. Eli placed his big old head up against the side of the Yazoo Dream and he pushed the two doctors from the university along with all of their discoveries right over to the levee landing. Doctors' pans and bones grabbed the side of that landing and they tied the raft up with a, and put it safely in place with a rope. Though they were drenched with rain, they walked up with smiles to the general store. When the rain let up, they went back to the river landing with their flashlights and they carried everything from the raft right up to the general store. The two men laid their newfound discoveries out in front of the general store then they went inside to dry off and drink some steaming hot coffee that Mr. Potter had just made. The next day, television people and newspaper reporters from as far away as Jackson, Memphis, and New Orleans all heard about how the two professors from the University of Dixie had discovered a bit of American history from an old French fort called Turnbull Stand in Satarsha, Mississippi. And the two researchers told the story about how they were saved in the middle of a rainstorm by a giant catfish that everyone from the village of Satarsha all knew by the name of Eli. Eli was already famous, but now Eli was also a hero. The end. And I have a picture of the press interview of the kids and the newspaper reporters and the television reporters from Memphis, New Orleans, and, New or and, and Jackson.